Carl, Louisiana. I'm Chef John Foles welcoming you to this great state of ours. These beautiful plantation homes reflect the fascinating history of our culture and cuisine, and I'd like to share this story with you. Why not join me and some of my friends as we visit the plantation homes of our state and cook up another great taste of Louisiana. Funding for this program was provided in part by Bruce Foods Corporation, makers of Louisiana Gold and other distinctive Louisiana-style food products. Often there are unique features that distinguish one plantation home from another. In some cases, it might be their location. In others, it could be their architecture. While in many, it might be their elaborate decor and furnishings. I know of one plantation home located 16 miles south of Natchitoches that's famous not for any of these aesthetic values, but because of the woman who built it. Marie Therese was a freed black slave woman who, along with her 14 children, not only constructed the home, but managed the plantation successfully for generations. I'm Chef John Foles. Welcome to Melrose Plantation. The African house standing at Melrose has puzzled historians and architects alike. It's made of brick and stands a story and a half tall with an overhanging roof similar to West African architecture. Its precise function when built is not known, but today it serves as a museum housing the murals depicting Cane River life by primitive artist Clementine Hunter. Clementine originally worked in the fields of Melrose as a girl and later became the cook of the house. She is by far the best known and most respected of all Louisiana's primitive artists. Yucca House, built in 1796, was the original colonial residence of the builder. The sills and uprights are virgin cypress, hand-hewn right there on the property. The walls of mud mixed with moss and deer hair were rubbed smooth after drying and then whitewashed in the place of painting. Yucca has housed more notable authors and historians than any other single residence in the South. After the death of the owner, Claude Mataria, in 1780, he deeded the property to his mistress, a black freed slave woman named Marie Therese. She and her Franco-African children worked diligently clearing the land while cultivating tobacco, corn, and other crops to achieve a successful plantation operation. She lived to age 73, and her children and grandchildren prospered and lived a good life in an otherwise oppressive South. Melrose Plantation, next to the little town of Natchitoches. Not only is Marie Therese kind of famous in Louisiana because of the fact that she was a freed black slave woman who did well, but just imagine how difficult it was for her and her children to do business in Louisiana back then. So she deserves a lot of credit in Louisiana and she gets it today. So a very special plantation home for you to visit, one owned by a black slave woman back in the late 1700s, a must see on our plantation routes here in Louisiana. Well, uh, in the kitchen coming to visit with me today is a, I call her the Creole queen when it comes to cooking. Leah Chase not only owns Dookie Chase's restaurant in New Orleans, but she's a great friend of mine who's been cooking professionally all over the world, not only in her restaurant in New Orleans, and she knows a lot about cooking, not only in the early days of Louisiana, but certainly a lot of the influence of the plantation kitchens on today's cuisine. So I'm looking forward to having my good friend Leah in the kitchen visiting with us in just a couple of minutes. The dishes of Melrose, well, it's one of the oldest Creole plantation homes standing in Louisiana, if not the oldest. So obviously we're gonna have a lot of that Spanish and French influence in the foods. But when I hear dishes like ratatouille, I think of a dish of vegetables like squash and eggplant cooked around the Mediterranean with a lot of provincial herbs in it. And this was one of the dishes that was cooked over at Melrose Plantation. I want to share that with you today, as well as a soup, a Creole tomato soup that was made famous right there 
at Melrose. So look at my little platter here. Again, I've got all of these great vegetables, all these pretty colors. I have the tomatoes, obviously, Creole tomatoes. I have some yellow squash. This is little summer squash, and this is zucchini coming over with the Italians, and black olives, and right here is some eggplant, purple eggplant, that always, that's always found in ratatouille. Here, I have some oregano, one of the herbs that's used in this particular dish. And of course, again, you can use anything you want in ratatouille. I'm gonna use this ratatouille to stuff some chicken breast. Uh, and when I first heard of that dish, I thought to myself, strange to stuff chicken with ratatouille, but that is so typical in Louisiana that we combine flavors to create a much better dish and any one of those flavors on their own would stand up. So it isn't too strange that ratatouille would stuff chicken. I put a little olive oil down into my black iron skillet. Now I'm going to add a touch of onions. Now remember, this dish comes from the Mediterranean, so it's going to have a lot of those really nice herbs de Provence, as we call it. I'm going to put some garlic, which is certainly a main ingredient in Provençal cuisine. And I'm going to wilt these uh, nice flavors in the olive oil. And then I'll add the tomato. How pretty this is. Comes together quickly. I'm going to add the squash. Ratatouille can be made, of course, with other vegetables. You normally think of ratatouille as a tomato and eggplant dish. But you can see that we're using a lot of different vegetables here because we had so many vegetables on the plantation. Now, a little olives from the French markets of New Orleans and the cubed eggplant. You'll notice also just how small I've cut all of these little bitty pieces because remember, this is gonna be a stuffing. So we wanna make sure that these pieces will fit easily into a little pocket in the breast of chicken. Now, once all of those flavors come together in the skillet, I'm gonna add a little touch of oregano down in here. I can also put some thyme. I can break some fresh thyme down in here, basil. All of those really wonderful herb flavors that you find around the Spanish cuisine and the Italian and Southern French cooking. All of those nice things coming together there. And then I'll season with a pinch of salt, a little bit cracked black pepper, and some of this really nice spicy hot pepper sauce right down into the stuffing. Once it's sauteed, then I'll go ahead and sprinkle in some seasoned Italian breadcrumbs to hold it all together as I would with any stuffing. I just want to pick up the fats down, in this case the olive oil, to make a nice little stuffing that will go right into the breast of chicken. Imagine how nice that's going to be. Now, of course, I have some of this already not only uh, uh, made, but I have it chilled because you have to chill it before it goes down into the breast of chicken. So I'm going to move this one right off of the heat here, get it out of the way. And <clears throat> let me show you exactly what it looks like once it's nice and chilled. Take a look at this. I have it really nice and uh, uh, it's, it's cool and all of the flavors have come together here. And I've taken a breast of chicken, I deboned it. And once it's deboned, I made a little cut right through the side of the breast. I left the skin on. And that's where I'm going to stuff this chilled ratatouille right down into the center of the breast like that. And use your, use your hands, kind of push it in to make sure it all gets down in there. This is going to be a baked chicken dish. So you don't have to cook the ratatouille forever. Just go ahead and cook it for a little while to get all of those flavors combined. And I want to show you this big skillet that I have here already with two or three breasts already stuffed. Look at here. I've got a couple of them in there already. And I'm going to add the next one, the one I just stuffed. I'll put it in here just like that. How pretty that is. And then I'll go ahead and I can season the outside of the chicken. Remember, the ratatouille is seasoned, but not the chicken itself. So I'm going to put a little bit of that down on top of the breast. Now, what kind of sauce would I pour on top of this? Well, I could make a really nice white sauce. I could start with flour and butter, season all of these onions and saute it in there, and then make a sauce and pour over the chicken. Of course, I could also do a tomato sauce, a really good tomato sauce, a lot of, a lot of good basil and thyme, and it would work well. 
But suppose you're in a rush. Sometimes I like to give you something that I would do to get out of a jam, and it's in this little picture here. I went to the store, and I got some cream of celery soup because the celery, of course, has a lot of great flavor, and when put over this ratatouille, which is full flavored with all of those nice vegetables, you can imagine how nice this simple white sauce right out of the can with all of those great celery flavors will come together to bake this particular chicken dish, the stuffed ratatouille uh, breast of chicken. I'll put more of the peppers on, season this again with a little salt, a touch of pepper, and into about, well, let's say about a 350 to 400 degree oven for about 45 minutes until the breast and the soup are, you know, all nice and bubbly. And let me show you what you're going to have when it's done because this is a great, great dish. And if you have a platter like this, it makes it even better. This here is a blue cobalt platter. Now, this is a very rare blue cobalt. This dates back to the 1700s, about the same time that Melrose was uh, built. And I can finish the breast of chicken with a, some of that purple cabbage to kind of pick up the purple in that cobalt blue. That's it right here, the stuffed chicken breast with ratatouille from Melrose Plantation. Now, the next dish that I want to do for you is a soup dish I was telling you about just a minute ago, the Creole tomato soup with shrimp. But the difference is that these tomatoes and the shrimp have been broiled first before even put it, getting them ready to go into the soup pot. And if you look at my little platter here, you can see that, again, I have the Creole tomatoes, but I've taken them with the shrimp, and I've put them in the oven, and I've broiled them to bring out all of the sugar in these two ingredients. Very important because there's so much sugar in tomato that you definitely want to try to extract some of that sweetness before you go into the pot with it. And that's what I've done right here by putting them in the broiler for about five or ten minutes or so just to bring out that sweetness, it'll definitely show up in the pot. So to make this dish, I'm going to add a little bit of the buttery flavored oil. I'm going to make a white roux just as I would have done if I would have made the sauce to go over the chicken. Again, I can put these nice onions, celery, bell pepper, all of the true flavors of good Louisiana cream soups. And imagine cream soup going back to the very early days of our cooking. I'm going to put a little garlic in here. Cream was all over the plantation, so you would have definitely seen it in the soup pots. So I'll put that little pretty uh, bell peppers in there to give the nice color to the cream. So I'll tear that around for just a second. And once that's done, then I would add these nice broiled tomatoes. How nice that is. I wish you could smell all of those flavors of the garlic and the tomato coming together in the bottom of this pot. It's really, really magnificent flavors. Now, I'm going to add a little bit shrimp and undoing. Now, the shrimp I have here is shrimp that's not uh, cooked or not broiled. This is just to make a nice shrimp stock in the bottom of this pot. It's going to start that nice shrimp flavor cooking in the bottom of this black iron. So I've added that into it and the andouille sausage. You see me use andouille, tasso, ham, smoked sausage. Very important in our Louisiana dishes. Once these things cook for just a minute or so, then I would have to make my white roux in the bottom of the pot. And how do I do that? Well, I just take a little bit flour and I sprinkle it in once all of these things have cooked for a couple of minutes. I would take a nice tablespoon or two, remembering that a level tablespoon will thicken about two cups to a soup consistency. I would kind of sprinkle this flour right into the butter. Again, remember, you won't have any dumplings forming in here because there's absolutely no water down in here. This is all oil or buttery flavored oil. So you're going to make a roux just as I would if I was making a white sauce. You see how it all comes together? I can just pick it right up out of that pot. Now I can add my stock. I'm going to add a little chicken stock to this. Of course, you could add shrimp stock if you had some. I'll just go ahead and pour it right down into my pot. And I always put my stock in hot. At least I try to to make sure that I don't uh, uh, stop the cooking process. This stock is hot, and you want to try to get it back to a rolling boil as quickly as possible because what we're making is a basic velouté, as I call it, a nice velouté, velvety in French. 
velvety soup. Once all of that is in there and we bring it back to a boil, it's going to get nice and thick. And then I can add about half, only half, because I want to keep some nice and fresh for the garnish at the end. I would add about half of these broiled uh, shrimp. Now, of course, I left the tail on, too, because I want to make sure that the tails are just part of the garnish. So I'm going to add most of these in. And then for seasoning, I'm going to put in a little hot pepper right here, a little touch of salt again, a little bit more of that black pepper, cracked black pepper, and stir all of that into that soup. You can see how nice and creamy it's going to be. And then, of course, I could add some heavy whipping cream into this if I wanted to. I could add just a little touch of whipping cream, or I could leave it out. It would be a really nice dish, but I would finish it with a touch of tomato sauce. See, that gives it that really nice pink, peachy color. And then you could add a couple tablespoons of uh, a quarter cup, let's say, of heavy whipping cream to it right at the end. And then finish it up with a touch of parsley or some green onions, just like that. And I would let that cook, as I say, for about 30 minutes. And I'm good, I would have just one of the most beautiful Creole tomato soups you ever saw in your life sitting in that pot right there. And flavor it right at the end with more of that great shrimp. So I'd go ahead and cut that off and let it just simmer for a couple of minutes while I show you a couple of the other dishes that I found at Melrose. Of course, Creole. So take a look at this. This is a Creole tomato aspic and seafood terrine. This is just tomato juice that's been cooked with shrimp. You can see the shrimp there, fish, crab meat. Really, really nice flavors. And then you gel it with a little bit uh, aspic, and it's a great hors d'oeuvre. And that was always served at Melrose, as was this dish. I found this very interesting. This is a Bermuda onion casserole. It's cream, just like the radishes on the early plantations, and then baked in the oven with a white sauce, just like the soup I just made. It's a fantastic dish. Bermuda onion casserole in a cream gravy and then baked. Okay, that's all of the dishes that I have for you today. I do have my good buddy that I told you was going to come out to visit with me in a second, Leah Chase, and I see her walking in. How you doing, Leah? Hi, John. How are you? <laughs> good, good to see, see you. How you been? How's Fine. everything over at Dookie's? Oh, doing great. Doing great. You know, it's always so good to see you. I read about you all the time. You are really the Creole queen of New Orleans when it comes to cooking. I know you, I know, I know you don't like all of those accolades, but it's no. the truth. Just, You've been doing it for working. a long time, too, huh? Just your daily work, John. But, what well, are you going to do? You know, last time I was at your place, I was there for, you might remember this, Holy Thursday, right. and, I, and I had a big old oh, pot of gumbo's herbs. That was, <laughs> that, was uh -huh. a, that was a while back, yeah. and I want to talk about that, but one of the things that I really enjoyed that day was the chicken liver pate that yeah. you did, and look, I've got all of the ingredients oh, here because I want you to help me right. make it. Now, I've taken my black iron skillet, I'm going to put just a little bit of butter. Why don't okay. you get that plate all of right. all of the ingredients back there that we talked about? Okay. And what go. I have here is... To make the chicken liver pate, I've got all of the onions and the celery, all those pretty colors, and of course, fresh chicken livers. You can poach them first, but I think it's always better to put them in like this, and I'm going to add this flavor. to the pot, just like that. Let me ask you a question. Was your mother a good cook? <laughs> oh, mother. No. She cooked because she had to. You know? <laughs> when all those children was like cooking for the army every day, so nobody wants to do that every day. But, uh, well, you know, somebody was telling me that your mother... She didn't, maybe didn't like to cook, but that she was a fabulous cook. Yeah, she could do it. You know, she did what she had to do, and she did it well. She taught us. Everybody had a turn in the kitchen. Whether you liked it or not, you had a turn in the kitchen. You had to start somewhere. Right. Now, look, I'm taking all of these chicken livers, and I'm going to mm. saute them in the garlic, mm. and you smell all those pretty peppers mm, and all of that coming good. together. Isn't that uh -huh. nice? Now yeah. I'm going to put a little bit allspice. Oh, the allspice gave it a good flavor, I think. And how about giving yeah. me a little touch of pepper and salt yeah. down in here? Get all those nice, here. just put a little pinch. Yeah. Ah, that's the way you said to do it, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah. and once all of those flavors come together, I would let this cook yeah. until it's done, but then I would flame it with a little yeah. touch of brown. Yeah. Yeah. Sure, put it in there. Mm -hmm. Just Give throw it, it on in. You're that's the expert right. here. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so now... We always mm -hmm. flame with brandy or sherry, right? Mm -hmm. That smells good. Didn't that go with that yeah. allspice now? Yeah. I don't want to burn the house down here, so but I'm going to put a little, a little brandy. bit brandy. I take it off of the fire because I don't want 
all of that. Brian did a flame up, but look at that. Yeah, hey. And, <laughs> isn't that nice? Yeah. And then, the plantation. that's the way it was done with a little <laughs> Cherelle right. whiskey or whatever. And I'll let this cook here for a minute because I have some already done. Let's take a yeah. walk over here. I have oh, the here little processor. Mm -hmm. You see it? And I can, I've got all of those things right in here. And I wanted you to put just a little touch Let's of that cream, cream, about a half a cup. And I'm going to put a little butter down in there. And then I'll just zap this around for a minute until it all comes together. I can just, that was good. Done, isn't it? Yeah. I can just zap it around like that until it all comes. But look what it looks like when it's done. Ah, isn't that that's beautiful? Good. Yeah. And then you would serve it with toast points. It's yeah. such a nice dish, really flavorful. Oh, and again, yeah. use of, I guess, uh, uh, less important meats on the plantation. Yeah, but that is very good. You know, you could have it before dinner. You could have it at night. Really a, a nice dish. Sit that. so down. Let's good. talk a little bit All more right. about cooking good. and about the plantation. Let me move this out of the way that's here. Good. I know this thing gets in gets in our way a good bit. <laughs> Leah, when did you begin cooking? <laughs> Well, I graduated from high school at age 16. It was nothing for me to do, and I didn't know how to do anything, really, and had to go home. But 10 kids behind me, so we had to hurry it up and do whatever we had to do to take care of those. So I went to work at a hotel over there, uh, a boarding house, really, is what it was, and I, I cooked there, cooked and, in a boarding and house. And that's where you got your professional start. Yep. Mm -hmm. Do you think that the foods of the early plantations, I'm talking about Melrose today and the Mataria family, do you think that the plantations had a tremendous influence on the way we cook today? Well, I think it, I think it had a lot of influence on the way we cook today. Uh, even with the traditions, the African traditions, you know, Africans came with a lot of traditions, a lot of superstitions that we still keep and we still have. The gumbo zeb, you know, you have to do it with uneven numbers of greens, either seven, nine, eleven, and it had to be uneven now, not even numbers. <laughs> or, it, or, it was, or it would be unlucky for unlucky, the rest of the year. Unlucky. Uh, why, why do you think that dishes like gumbo zab, as, as I just mentioned, I have it at your place on, on Holy Thursday, uh, these dishes came from the Congo, like uh, Congri, the black eyed peas. Yeah. Why have they endured for so many years in New Orleans? We hadn't lost them. Because New Orleans is so full of tradition. You know, they go down with the same thing. And one time we tried to lose that. I, I saw no reason for losing whatever tradition you had, you know. Uh, Just keep that tradition and keep it going. And we had that one day a year, Holy Thursday. And, and people could look forward they to eating it forward only to that on that on day. Holy Thursday, right. Is it the traditions that we hold so near and dear to our heart that make the foods of Louisiana so exciting? Yes, I think so. I think it's our tradition, our love for food, our love for our heritage and our background that really makes it work for us. Now, I know people coming to the city in New Orleans, myself, when I eat out in New Orleans, the first restaurant I think about, and I really mean this, is Ducky Chase, is your restaurant. <laughs> uh, is it just that? Is it those traditions that we're talking yeah. about right now that really make your food so sought after? Yeah, you know, we don't change too much. We do basically... And I learned that the hard way, John. When I uh, worked in New Orleans before I married Dookie, I worked on the other side of town, and I tried to feed uh, my people those cream sauces, and they didn't like them. They didn't know about them. So I went to work with what I had. You know, I said, well, let me go back to my own roots. And that's what you have to do. You have to put yourself in that pot. You have to put your love in there, and it works for you. It works for me. Well, I can honestly tell you that nobody, no cook that I know, puts more of their own heart and soul into a pot than Leah Chase. And I look forward to eating with you whenever I'm in the I city. And, hey, thank you so you much for coming right. to visit with us today. All and right. thank you for that recipe for the chicken yeah, livers. And y'all really come great. back again and visit with thank us you. as we look at more plantations and cook up Taste of Louisiana. Right. Why don't we finish up that serve right. we were just looking at a minute ago.
Funding for this program was provided in part by Bruce Foods Corporation, makers of Bruce's Yams and other distinctive Louisiana-style food products. Chef John Fosa's Plantation Celebrations, Recipes from Our Louisiana Mansions, is a full-color 335-page book containing food history, recipes, and over 150 photographs from these southern landmarks. For your copy, send a check or money order for $28.50 to Louisiana Public Broadcasting, 7860 and Selmo Lane, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, 70810. Or use your credit card by calling toll-free 1-800-973-7246.